Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, it's reported commonly, this is common knowledge, that there is fornication among you and even the heathen who are okay with fornication know this is wrong, that one should have his father's wife and you are puffed up. Now, Paul says on five different occasions to the Corinthians, you're puffed up. You have an inflated view of yourself. You're filled with pride. The word is only found six times in the New Testament. Five of them are here in Corinthians. The other is in Colossians 2.18 when Paul says, when he speaks of those who have a voluntary humility. I'm going to volunteer to be humble. Are you? Doesn't work that way. And he goes on to say, the worshiping of angels intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. And every other time the word puffed up is used, it's used with regard to the Corinthians. Now, notice what he says in verse 2, and I've always known that this is different. It's not the way we would normally think. And you are puffed up and have not rather been moved to righteous indignation that someone like this in your midst is not put out right now. Get rid of him. That's not the language he uses. He says you've not rather mourned. That's a different attitude, isn't it, than righteous indignation. Mourning. The same word with reference to mourning over the dead. And you've not rather, he said, hope that the one that hath done this deed might be taken from you. Not that you deal with it, but that they might be taken from you if they continue in this. Paul says you should be mourning. Now this mourning that he uses is the same word used in the second beatitude. Blessed are they. Blessed by God. The Lord knows who's truly blessed. Now I realize that this word is used quite a bit in our day. I have people who say quite frequently to me, I'm blessed. And I hope you are. I don't want to be, um, I don't know what I want to be when I hear that, but I, I do know this, the Lord knows who is blessed. And he says, blessed are the poor, blessed are they that mourn. And this is one of the most paradoxical, oxymoronic statements ever made. Put the two together. Happy are they that mourn. Happy are they who are sad. Coupled with the Lord's statement in Luke chapter 6 verse 21, blessed are you that weep now, for you shall be comforted. And he says, blessed or woe unto you that laugh now. And that word woe is a sentence of judgment. When the Lord says woe, that means woe. Woe unto you that laugh now. You shall weep and mourn. And the word mourn is the strongest of the nine Greek words which express sorrow. This is the word that's used to describe mourning over the dead. You mourn when one is dead 
and you can't bring them back. Now, as long as they're sick, there's some hope that something can be done. As long as there's breath, there's still some hope that something can be done. But when a loved one dies, you mourn. There's nothing you can do to bring them back. You're powerless to change that event. Now, your attitude, Paul says, about this event, this one among you who's doing that which even a Gentile, a pagan, a heathen knows is wrong, you should be mourning over this, weeping over this. This would be what Paul called in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, godly sorrow. Not the sorrow of the world. There's plenty of that. You know, in this world, there's sorrow, there's disappointment, there's discouragement, there's trouble, mourning over the death of a loved one. Man that's born of woman is born to trouble. As the sparks fly upward. That was Job's assessment. If you read the Psalms of David, you'll read much about the anguish of his soul. Much of the Psalms are spent in that. I'm thankful for the Psalms, aren't you? They express what we can't express ourselves, but we feel them better than we can express them when we read the Psalms. Paul spoke of fightings within, fears without. What a description. Inside fighting, outside fears over what I see taking place. But the morning he exhorts the Corinthians toward and the morning of the second beatitude is the morning that only a believer experiences. No unbeliever experiences this. Mourning over sin. Now an unbeliever mourns over the consequences of sin and the trouble sin brings in their lives. There's no question about that. But it's only a believer that mourns over the sin itself. Because only a believer really understands what sin is in the first place. An unbeliever does not have a true concept of what sin is in the first place. A believer does. And this is continual. It's something that goes on all the time. I mourn over my sin. I mourn over your sin. I mourn over sin. That's the attitude of the believer, and that's what the Lord says Blessed are they that mourn. This is a state of blessedness. Now I think of the Beatitudes. I love the Beatitudes. I'm more amazed by the Beatitudes. You know them. Blessed are they that, blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn. They shall be comforted. This is the Lord's description of who's blessed. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are you that are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are they who are persecuted for righteousness. Now, I want you to think about this. None of these beatitudes can even be grasped or understood apart from the concept of sin. Every single one of them. Now think about this. Why are you poor? Because your sin has made you bankrupt. Your sin has made you void of anything that you could recommend yourself to God with. You're poor because of sin. Why do you mourn? You mourn over your sin. You say with David, my sin is ever before me. You might not be Mourning before other people, but in your heart before God, you mourn over your sin. Why are you meek? Because you know who God is and you know who you are, a sinner. Therefore, you're meek before God. What about hungering and thirsting after righteousness? The promise that you'll be filled. The reason you hunger and thirst after righteousness is because you know because of your sin you don't have any 
personal righteousness. And you hunger and thirst after righteousness. What about being pure in heart? What does that have to do with seeing sin? It's only the pure in heart who sees sin. If you don't have a pure heart given to you by God, you don't even know what sin is and you don't know what it means to mourn over sin. It's only the pure in heart who see sin in the first place and mourn over it. What about blessed are the merciful? Well, because you're a sinner, your only hope is God showing you mercy. And that's why you'll be merciful. He's shown you mercy in your sinfulness. What about blessed are the peacemakers? What's that got to do with sin? Well, the peacemaker knows that the only peace is the peace that Christ made by the blood of his cross. They know that. That's their message. That's the message they want to bring to the world. Blessed are the peacemakers. That's not just talking about someone who's not contentious. It's good to not be contentious. It's good to contentious. It's, it's good to be not argumentative and be but that's not talking about that. The peacemakers is the person who preaches the gospel of peace, who stands for the gospel of peace. And those who are persecuted for righteousness sake are people who believe themselves to be sinners and the only righteousness they have is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's the message they stand for. That's the message they preach. And the world doesn't love that message because that message takes away what they're hoping in, their works. You see, this State a believer is in. The state of blessedness, blessed by God, none of those things are really grasped or understood apart from this thing called sin. Mourning over sin. This thing of mourning over sin is a continual state with a believer. Now he's not, he's rejoicing at the same time. I, I rejoice in Christ right now while I'm talking to you. I rejoice that everything God requires of me, he looks to his son for. I rejoice in the beauty of Jesus Christ. And I have reason all the time to mourn over my sin. That's exactly what David meant when he said, my sin. Yes, he was talking about Bathsheba, but he was talking about more than that. He didn't just talk about what happened with Bathsheba. He said, my sin is ever before me. It's always there. And in our state, as believers, walking in this world, this is our state. Uh, yes, we rejoice in Christ. Yes, we're poor in spirit. Yes, we Mourn. And this is not only a New Testament concept. It's just like everything else in the New Testament. It's clearly taught in the Old Testament. I've talked about Psalm 51. Turn with me there for a moment. Psalm 51. This is David's cry of repentance. When Nathan says to him, thou art the man. Look what he says in verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Now that's the believer's attitude towards sin. That's mourning over sin. Turn with me to Isaiah 61. This is the passage that uh, the Lord used in his first sermon when he returned to Galilee. You can read about this in Luke chapter 4, but you'll recognize this. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim <clears throat> liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. 
to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. Look at this next phrase. To comfort all that mourn. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion. That's speaking of the mourning of sin. To give unto them beauty for ashes. What? what? Ashes. Ashes. There's no energy in ashes. To give them beauty for ashes. The oil of joy for mourning. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. That they might be called trees of righteousness. The planting of the Lord. That he might be glorified. Turn with me for a moment to Ezekiel chapter 36. Now this is God's promise of the new heart. He says in verse 26. A new heart. Ezekiel 36, verse 26, a new heart also will I give you. Ezekiel 36, a new heart will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. Now included in that, look at verse 31. When I give this new heart, then shall you remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good and shall loathe yourselves. In your own sight, for your iniquities and for your abominations. That is part of the new heart. It's part of the new covenant. Turn with me to Zechariah, the second to the last book in the Old Testament. Zechariah, Malachi, then the New Testament starts. Chapter 12. Verse 10, and I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem as the mourning of hated remnant in the valley of Megadon. And the land shall mourn every family apart. The family of the house of David apart. The wives apart. The family of the house of Nathan apart. The wives apart. You see, this is a private thing. You don't really mourn with somebody else. This is something that goes on in your heart between you and the Lord. It's not something you're trying to broadcast and to show how sorrowful you are. It's what goes on in your heart before the Lord this morning he speaks of. And then we read in verse 14, all the families that remain, every part, family apart, their wives apart, in that day there shall be a fountain opened. There's the gospel. In that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. Now, turn with me to Romans 7 for a moment. This is what this morning looks like. Now remember, he says with regard to these people, he says you should be mourning over the sin of this man, just like you mourn over the sin of your own. A true, genuine mourning. Now look what Paul says in verse 14. For we know, every believer knows this, and only the believer knows it. We know that the law is spiritual, exceeding broad. But I am carnal, sold under sin. My mourning of sin is such that it's like the death of someone. I can't bring them back. This is a mourning before God over sin. Look in verse 24 of the same chapter. O wretched man that I used to be before God saved me. No. Present tense. Just like when he says, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal. Not I was carnal before I was saved. 
You don't know you're carnal until you are saved. Oh, wretched man that I am. Present tense. Right now. Paul, don't you rejoice in Christ? Of course. You see, really, this is, the, this is a, a healthy believer. Romans 7 describes the healthy state of a believer. If someone doesn't feel like this, it's because they're spiritually sick. It's because they're backslidden and hardened, or it's because they're lost. This is the feeling of a healthy believer. This is what mourning looks like. Paul says, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death. That word wretched means miserable, afflicted, and tormented, and the, only the believer has this attitude towards sin. Now, an unbeliever has this attitude toward the consequences of sin, and the trouble it brings in their life, and the way it wrecks their lives, or makes them lose their job, or wrecks their homes, or whatever it might be, but a believer mourns over sin. And that's their attitude towards the sin in others. It's not righteous indignation. It's mourning. You actually feel for that person because you know you're just as bad. Mourning. Now I love what the Lord said with regard to those who mourn. Blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted. It doesn't say they might be comforted or perhaps they'll be comforted. It says they shall be comforted. Every single person that mourns. They, this is the promise of Christ, they shall be comforted. And this comfort is with regard to what they're mourning over. What he has done about their sins. That's what brings comfort. Now turn with me to the Gospel of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. God says to the prophet Isaiah, Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. The same people that is said of Christ, he shall save his people from their sins. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. Now understand this. Every gospel message, I don't care what the scripture you're dealing with, I don't care whether people are being reprimanded on some level, and the people at Corinth here were being reprimanded on some level, weren't they? Of course they were. And there is a place for that in preaching. But every message must be comforting, or it's not a gospel message. I want you to think about that. If it's not a comforting message, it's not a gospel message. Now, even if I'm being reprimanded, and I need it, you need it, if it leads me to think, oh, I must not be saved, I, it wasn't preached right, or I didn't hear it right, every message, without exception, is to be a message of comfort. And that message of comfort has something to do with sin and how I'm delivered from this sin that I mourn over. Now look what he says in verse 2. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem. And my marginal reading says speak to the heart of Jerusalem. Speak to the heart. Now the heart is not... Um, some kind of ethereal 
a thing that you can't get hold. Uh, yes, emotion is involved in the heart, but the heart means the whole man. The heart means the understanding. The heart means the affections. The heart means the will. Only the gospel is addressed to the heart. Now, free will religion is addressed to what? The will. Reform religion is addressed to what? The intellect. Pentecostalism, charismatic religion, is addressed to what? The emotions and the feelings. But the gospel is addressed to the heart. I love that scripture in Romans chapter 10, verse 9. With the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. You know what you believe with? You believe with your heart. That doesn't mean I'm believing with something I can't really understand. Or, no. With my understanding, I believe that the righteousness of Jesus Christ is the only righteousness I possess. I understand that. As well as a sinner can understand something, I understand that. I want it to be that way. If you're giving me a choice, do you want to be saved by your own righteousness or the righteousness of Jesus Christ? Guess which one I choose? I want to be saved by the righteousness of Christ. And I love this. I love being saved by the righteousness of Christ. It's, it, I love it. It's, it's the gospel message. Speak to the heart of Jerusalem. And look what he says to tell in verse 2. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her. Say it loud. So she can hear. And that doesn't mean I'm supposed to start screaming at the top of my lungs to make sure you hear. But it's talking about this is something you need to hear. Cry unto her. Look uh, in this same chapter, verse 6. The voice said, cry. And he said, what shall I cry? <laughs> well, the Lord's going to tell us what we're to cry. All flesh is grass. That's what to cry. And all the goodliness thereof, as the flower of the field, the grass withers, the flower fades because the Spirit of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people is grass, the grass withers, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. That's the gospel message. Cry in her. Now, there's three things he says to cry with regard to her sin. Verse 2, cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished. That her iniquity is pardoned. For she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Now, this is what comforts somebody that mourns. He says, first tell her, her warfare is accomplished. And I know exactly what that warfare is that he's speaking of. The same thing that Paul spoke of in Galatians chapter 5, verse 17, when he said, the flesh lusts against the spirit and this is going on in the same man, coming out of his one consciousness. Two things, flesh and spirit. And he's not talking, about the, not talking about the Holy Spirit. He's talking about what the Holy Spirit birthed, that's where it came from. But he's not talking about the Holy Spirit, like the Holy Spirit's lusting against the flesh and there's this fight going on. That's, that doesn't even make sense. And it's contrary to the omnipotence of the Holy Spirit. He, he's... He's all-powerful. This is talking about the spiritual nature that every believer has, the old man and the new man. That's what the Bible calls it, the old man and the new man. The flesh and the spirit. The flesh lusts against the spirit. The spirit lusts against the flesh. These two are contrary one to the other. So you, you the one person, you don't say, well, flesh here, spirit there. No, you're one person. It comes out of one consciousness. So that you cannot do the things that you would. Now that's the warfare he's talking about that goes on in the breast of every believer 
every day, all the time. Your war, you, the victory's already been won. You might have a skirmish going on, but listen to this. It is finished. Victor's already won. Her warfare is accomplished. Well, that comforts me because I, I do have the flesh lusting against the spirit, the spirit lusting against the flesh in my heart all the time. You do too. What a blessed thing to know that it is finished. Her warfare is finished, accomplished. And the second thing he says to say, tell her not only that her warfare is accomplished, but that her iniquity is pardoned, forgiven, put away. Now, notice he doesn't say her iniquity will be forgiven if fill in the blank. But it's a declaration. Your iniquity is forgiven. The glory of the gospel is that it doesn't end with the forgiveness of sins. If you do this, this, get this straightened out, stop doing this, start doing that, get rid of this, you'll have the forgiveness of sins. That's just salvation by works. That's all it is. The gospel begins with this message. You're forgiven. All your iniquities are blotted out. Separated from you as far as the east is from the west. Cast behind the back of God. They are no more. Now here's the third thing he gives that comforts that person who mourns. And like I said, look, don't, don't ever think there's a time where the, I need to quit mourning. No, as long as you have sin, as long as you have an old nature, an evil nature, you have reason to mourn all the time. It's always there. And that's a good thing. You know what your mourning does over sin? Makes you look nowhere but Christ. You don't have anywhere else to look. That's a good thing. You know, the Lord could have made it to where you didn't sin anymore. He could have, but he didn't. I don't know what all his purpose in that is, but I know this. I don't have anything but Christ. That's what poor in spirit is. I don't have anything but Christ. And then he says, tell her, in verse 2, that she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Not only has she been forgiven, better than that. She's been justified. Not only have your sins been removed, they've been made non-existent. Put away. I love the way David said, blot out my iniquity. That means erase it, make it to where it never happened. And that's what the Lord has done with all the sins of his people. Blessed are they that mourn. This is a state of supreme blessedness. It's what Christ calls blessed. Not what some man calls blessed. This is how Christ identifies who that blessed person is. And this attitude of mourning over my sin ought to make my attitude towards the sin of others one of mourning over their sin. That's what Paul said to the Corinthians. You're puffed up and have not rather mourned over this taking place. As long as we're in the flesh, we're going to have reason to mourn, but we have this continual promise. Blessed are they that mourn. Oh, may the Lord cultivate this attitude in us in every respect, mourning over sin. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Let's pray.
Lord, how we thank you for the comfort of the gospel. How we thank you that our warfare is accomplished. Our iniquity is pardoned and we've received of thy hand double for all of our sins. Lord, the comforts of your gospel are glorious. Lord, deliver us from having a hardened attitude towards sin in ourselves or sin in others. But give us this mourning over sin. That's above the strength and energy of this flesh. We ask that by your spirit we might embody being poor, mourning, meek, hungering and thirsting after righteousness, pure in heart, merciful, peacemakers, being persecuted for righteousness. Lord, allow us that, your blessing, for Christ's sake. And Lord, as we face this coming week, we pray for grace. We ask that you would order our steps in your word, that you'd let no iniquity have dominion over us. We would remember that, but would you enable us to have open doors to preach your gospel to others and may we be enabled to be thy witnesses. Be with all your people, Lord, this church, the people that are in trouble, we pray for your blessing upon them. Those that are going through difficulties in their homes, we pray for your kind, merciful grace upon them. We, those that are sick, those that are suffering, Lord, cause us to be sensitive and loving toward each other. Thank you for the fellowship we have in your son. In Christ's name we pray, amen.